So we'll start with a puzzle. As consumers, we all benefit from constant innovation, right? Even the technology of a decade ago looks ridiculous now, let alone a few decades ago. <laughs> Compare this to the iPod. It takes tapes. Ooh. And even the iPod's gotten way better over its 10-year lifespan. Yet much of the world uses representative democracy, which was invented 2,000 years ago in ancient Athens. The United States, where I live, has a constitution that's over 200 years old. In any other field, using 200-year-old technology would be ridiculous. If you drove a car that was 200 years old, it would be a horse. And this 18th century Western governance doesn't seem to be doing so well at coping with 21st century problems. You know, since the failure of communism, China's been more adaptable in its governance. But even China has adapted new governance technology far more slowly than new consumer technology. So this is our puzzle. Why does a technology like music players advance really fast, while a really important technology like governance progresses slowly? So we have to understand what progress is. Progress is basically finding things that are new and better. And the way we find things that are new and better is from experiments, from trial and error, from trying potential new better things to see if they're actually better. This is how we get progress in science. We do experiments. And it's how we get progress in technology, mainly through the decentralized experiments that we call startups. Every startup is an experiment with some idea. Most of them fail. But those that succeed change the world and make humanity better. Speaking of humanity, life itself came from a billion plus years of decentralized experiments called evolution. And I say this to point out that this idea of progress through experiments, this is not some new idea, controversial idea, or narrow idea. It's actually a deep, deep part of how the world works. So what if we apply this lens to governance? What if we think about governance progress and ask, when do we get governance experiments, and do we get enough of them? What if we look at governance as an industry, like a, an economic sector, where countries are like firms and citizens are like customers? Not denying the moral and philosophical dimensions, but you know, setting it aside so that we can not all get mad and angry and yell at each other, but just talk rationally. So the first question we might ask is whether this governance industry is big, right? Maybe it doesn't get a lot of innovation because it's something little and unimportant. Actually, it's the biggest industry in the world, about 30% of global GDP. So it's incredibly important what kind of quality and progress we get in this field. And you'd think that it would attract the brightest innovators from around the world. Well, hopefully at least performs pretty well. Not so much. <laughs> this field is legendary for poor performance. Now, Hong Kong is one of the only territories to consistently have a budget surplus and actually accumulate cash reserves. But the largest firm in the industry, the United States, lost $1.3 trillion last year. Not so good. And the worst companies kill their own customers. This is one screwed up industry. What's going on? Economists used to think that the main drivers of, of prosperity were tangible things, like resources and capital. But they don't think that anymore. They think it's mainly driven by intangibles, like rules, institutions, and culture. We can see this dramatically in the example of Korea. By historic accident, one nation with similar people and similar resources was split in two. Two very different governance systems were used, and they got very different results. The results are as clear as light. Now, one explanation people sometimes give is just, we're at the pinnacle. You know, the best governance technology, it's already been invented. It's here. That's been said before in other fields. It's always been wrong. It may be true in a million years, but we're a long way from that. I mean, I would describe that perspective as a failure of the imagination. We're constantly making new scientific advances, inventing new ways to communicate and interact and coordinate. Surely these advances are constantly giving rise to new possible forms of government that we could use. Let's look very briefly at two from the infinite possibilities. The first I'll call dynamic democracy. 
This is the idea of taking representative democracy to the next level. Imagine that you just had a website where you could give your vote to anyone you wanted, whenever you wanted, issue by issue. You could give one person a vote for human rights. You could give another person your vote on economic matters. And then if they didn't choose to vote on specific laws, it would go to whoever they gave their vote to. So you'd give your vote to your friend who you trust on a specific issue. This would have been impossible just 20 years ago. Nowadays with the internet, it would be easy. For another model, consider Apple Nation. <laughs> Suppose Apple's genius designers use their incredible insight on user experience to try to create a, country, a city that's as fun to use as an iPad. You agree to the rules when you sign up. I mean, we have, we have software as a service, why not governance as a service? Every year you decide whether to renew your membership or to leave. Some people say, oh, that would be terrible because you don't have a voice in how Apple Nation is run, but it seems to produce pretty good iPads. The problem is that we evolved in small tribes of 100 people where you could talk everything else out and voice worked. But in huge modern societies, it doesn't scale. In a crowd, voices aren't heard. What works well in our large modern societies is choice. Lots of different pro producers making lots of different products, all competing for your business. Right after, as customers of Starbucks, we get no voice in what kind of coffee they serve. We don't get to vote on whether they should add a pumpkin spice latte. <laughs> but we get great coffee because they know that if they don't make us a great product, we'll go somewhere else. When you're forced to be a customer, on the other hand, of exactly one governance business, when you're not allowed to exit, of course you get the bad service of a monopoly, as in Communist East Berlin. Speaking of communism, this way of thinking gives a different perspective. The problem is not that it failed, it was an experiment. Most experiments fail, that's great, that's how we learn. But because most experiments fail, to be safe experimenters, we have to experiment small. You wouldn't try a new medicine on hundreds of millions of people in the first phase one trials, right? That would be ridiculous, it would be incredibly dangerous. What if it turns out to be poison and not medicine? Inflicting a new form of government on hundreds of millions of people, it's kind of the same thing. We need something more like opt-in clinical trials for politics. So now we have all the pieces to understand what's going on in this industry, why it has poor performance, why it's not constantly innovating with new political, economic, legal, and judicial systems. Right? The recipe for progress is to have experiments. The way you get better things is to test new things. We're not going to get better governance unless we test new governance. And the problem is that unlike the software industry, where you can make a new product with just a laptop, the barrier to enter the governance industry is that you need a physical place with autonomy. In a sense, that's what happened in Hong Kong. After World War II, the unusual political status led administrators like John Calperthwaite bring in the best rules and institutions from around the world, rules which were very unusual in this region and led to unprecedented economic growth. As a result, Hong Kong has a different system which works better even now that it's part of China. But this happened by historic accident. What we need is a structure that lets us continuously try experiments like Hong Kong. The lack of this structure is a huge problem for humanity. I mean, just look at any newspaper today, and you can see how current governance is not meeting current challenges. But as an entrepreneur, I mean, what am I describing? Giant industry, old technology, serving customers poorly, not, not innovating. This is the recipe for an industry ready to be disrupted by nimble new competitors. We just have to figure out how. If we could create a startup sector for government with a low barrier to entry for entrepreneurs, we could let a thousand experiments like Hong Kong bloom, continuously evolving better ways for us to organize ourselves socially. For me, I find this viewpoint makes politics less emotional. It's not a fight about right and wrong. I just, as a consumer, I don't like the options out there. I want to see a wider diversity of governance structures. I want to see more options so I can find one that fits me. All right, how? To create a startup sector for governance, what we need is 
local autonomy. You don't need sovereignty. We can see that from Hong Kong. You need enough local autonomy that you can create a bubble with different rules, institutions, and culture than the surrounding area. There's two basic ways. You can either go someplace that's currently governed and get permission from the state, or you can go someplace ungoverned. There's other ways involving guns and dudes and killing people and stuff, but we don't want to talk about those. <laughs> so the key to this first method is an explicit partnership between a host country and a city administrator in order to have a voluntary partnership. This approach has been developed and championed by economist Paul Romer, who calls it Charter Cities. And you can learn a lot more about these Charter Cities from the chartercities.org website, uh, or by watching Paul's great TED Talks, his original 2009 TED Global talk about the idea, or his 2011 talk about Honduras. Honduras. So this idea of charter cities is no longer speculative. In July, Honduras created the world's first charter city program in order to provide economic opportunity for their people. Coincidentally, maybe not, I co-founded a company in August called Future Cities Development to put these ideas into practice. We've raised a million dollar seed round and we're going to Honduras next week in order to talk to the leaders and the citizens there and see whether it would be a beneficial partnership. And we're also interested in finding other host countries who are progressive enough to see how this might help their people. The other option is a little more unusual. We can go someplace ungoverned, right? If we can open a new frontier and build new cities, then we can try new forms of government. And the next frontier before space is the oceans, closer and easier than space. And technology is getting to a point where we'll soon be able to settle the oceans. We call this seasteading or homesteading the high seas. Now the main challenge for charter cities is a political challenge, finding politicians who will implement this kind of system. Seasteading is about an engineering challenge. It's a difficult challenge, but humans have proven themselves very good at handling engineering challenges. How can we adapt the existing oil rig technology to build safe, low cost, modular structures to settle the oceans? Now one of the cool things about the ocean is it's actually a wonderful base on which to build new societies. One reason is that it covers two thirds of the Earth's surface. So if we can solve these difficult engineering challenges, we can build new cities and experiment with new forms of government on two thirds of the Earth's surface. The other neat thing is that the ocean is physically different from land. It's modular, it's rearrangeable. A large cruise ship is literally as big as a skyscraper and it moves around all the time. So you could actually reconfigure cities on the ocean. A successful ocean city could grow by moving buildings from less successful cities and adding them to its territory. There's a sense in which on the ocean, the right of secession is guaranteed by the laws of physics. To explore these ideas, I founded the Sea Study Institute in 2008 with Peter Thiel, founder of PayPal and first investor in Facebook. Some of the things we've done in our few years, uh, lots of global media coverage, in fact, we're in The Economist magazine today. Uh, a dozen papers, hundreds of pages on the practical aspects of how we can do this in the next decade. Uh, ocean engineering, international maritime law, business models, economics. We've got hundreds of donors and thousands of followers. And we've published a detailed design for a 200 guest hotel resort sized for the waves off Los Angeles. Current work includes ongoing engineering and legal research, academic partnerships, an invite-only network of entrepreneurs and investors working on businesses in this field, and we're working on a conference for next year. Rough timeline, we think that the earliest CSTEDs will be modified shifts uh, using new business models on old, on old engineering technology, scaling up from small shifts to larger ones. About five years, we'll see the first multi-business platforms and about 10 years till multiple of those platforms start expanding into a village. These two approaches have different costs and benefits. As I mentioned, charter cities require buy-in from politicians. Uh, Seasteads require solving engineering challenges. Charter cities can start sooner, perhaps as early as next year in Honduras, using existing infrastructure designs, but innovative forms of governance. Seasteads, as you saw in that timeline, it's going to be 10 years before we have something large. 
On the other hand, seasteads can scale much bigger. The Honduran program enables these charter cities in one tiny part of the world. Seasteads, if we can solve the engineering challenges, will open up two-thirds of the Earth's surface. And in terms of autonomy, obviously a charter city is limited deeply by the autonomy that the host country will grant it. Seasteads are much more likely to be able to have a path to full sovereignty. And together, these are an incredible portfolio, right? We have something that's more limited that we can start now, charter cities. We have something that can scale much bigger and accomplish more of the goals that will take another five to 10 years of research. It's a great combination. So we live in interesting times, and if you're interested in learning more, check out the websites, uh, seasteading.org or futurecitiesdev.com. Thank you.